Good evening, this is Dominique from Evander Revival Center. I've come to bring a word to you on this Thursday night that I believe is going to speak to your heart. In a moment, I'm going to get into the word of God and I want to share with you a revelation that God has shared with me that has impacted me. And I believe it's going to speak to your heart. And I want you to open up your heart and be ready for what God wants to speak to you through this word. So, so tonight we're going to go into the book of 2 Kings chapter 20. I'm going to share with you a fascinating story. A story of God's miracle work in power. But also how God can reverse the verdict. Now what is a verdict? That is where... There's a verdict that is made, a sentence that is uttered in a court, and that's how it's going to be. And that's the judgment that has been delivered. And I believe no matter what the verdict is on this side of eternity, no matter what any man says, God can reverse the verdict. Where people say it is impossible, God says it is possible. And tonight I want to take you into the word of God. I want to share the word of God with you. And I want to encourage you in your faith because I believe we are living in a time where we need a lot of encouragement in the word of God. So tonight we are going into 2 Kings chapter 20 verse 1 to 7. Thank you to all of you that have come online. Thank you to all of you that are commenting already here on this live feed. Thank you to every single one of you that share the word. I appreciate it. I see all the comments and I see all the shares. And I'm so grateful for it. And thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this word. Well, tonight I'm in 2 Kings chapter 20. And I'm going to be reading the first seven verses. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1 to verse 7. Now, listen to what the Bible says. About that time, Hezekiah became deathly ill. And the prophet Isaiah went to visit him and he gave the king this message. This is what the Lord says. Set your affairs in order. You are going to die. You will not recover from this illness. When Hezekiah heard this, he turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. And this is what Hezekiah prayed. Remember, O Lord, how I've always tried to be faithful to you and do what is pleasing in your sight. Then he broke down and wept bitterly. But before Hosiah had left the middle of the courtyard, this message came to him from the Lord. Go back to Hezekiah, the leader of my people, and tell him, this is what the Lord God of your ancestor David says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears. I will heal you. And three days from now, you will get out of bed and go to the temple of the Lord. Now, I want to say that prophetically to somebody. Listen to this. I want you to take this promise and make it your own. God says, I have heard your prayer and I have seen your tears. I will heal you. Second Kings chapter 20 verse 5. Make that a promise from God. It's for you. Verse 6. I will add 15 years to your life and I will rescue you and the city from the king of Assyria. And I will do this to defend my honor for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah's servant, Make an ointment from figs and spread it over the boil. They did this and Hezekiah recovered. In other words, he was healed. Now, the story of Hezekiah is a very fascinating story in the Old Testament. Hezekiah was one of the kings of the tribe of Judah. Now, this was in a time where the kingdom of Israel had split up into two kingdoms, the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Long gone were the glory days of Solomon. And Hezekiah comes to the throne at a young age. He is 25 years old when he becomes king over Judah, the Lord's people. Hezekiah is immediately faced with so much opposition outside of the kingdom and inside the kingdom. 
All the odds are stacked against Hezekiah because there's an enemy that is threatening to wipe out the whole tribe of Judah. Not only that, the tribe of Judah had drifted away from God and got involved in idol worship. They worshiped Baal. Hezekiah's father, King Ahaz, was actually a wicked man. Ahaz was a man that worshipped Baal and he worshipped idols. The Bible says he did not do what was right in the sight of the Lord. Now, Hezekiah was the complete opposite. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. You see, in the Old Testament, there were kings that did what was right in the sight of God. Those were good kings. Those were kings that God blessed and prospered. And then there were kings that did not do what was right in the sight of God. And they experienced downfall as they rebelled in the spirit. Now, King Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, was one of those kings. In fact, he was so wicked that he sacrificed one of his sons in a fire to an idol. He practiced pagan worship and he worshiped pagan idols on hills and mountaintops which grieved God. And not only that, he provoked God to anger because he led the nation of Judah into idol worship. And if that was not bad enough, he manipulated Judah's worship towards Jehovah to suit him. When King Ahaz died, Hezekiah took the throne. And like I said, he was a good king. One of the first things that King Hezekiah did was he tore down all the places of idol worship. He destroyed the sites of idol worship in Judah. And the Bible says that he restored the temple and the worship of Judah back unto Jehovah God. Second Chronicles chapter 29. In fact, listen to what the Bible says about Hezekiah. Second Kings chapter 18 verse 5 to verse 7. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before him or after him. He held fast unto the Lord and did not stop from following God. He kept the commands of the Lord that had been given through Moses. And the Lord was with him and he was successful in whatever he undertook. So as King Hezekiah put God first and he put his trust in God, the Bible says that God prospered him. He was blessed. This was a man that was not only prosperous, wealthy, but he was a man that had tremendous victory on the battlefield. He overcame the Philistines. Now, the Philistines were difficult to overcome for many of the kings in the Old Testament. But David was able to overcome the Philistines. And the Bible says Hezekiah overcame the Philistines. This was a good king. This was a king that had a dedicated prayer life unto God. He was devoted unto God. He had a good walk with God. But yet, yeah, we read in 2 Kings chapter 20 how this king is sick. And he's not just sick. He's busy dying. Now, we've seen this happen. We've seen how good people suffer. We see how good people become sick. We live in a broken world and in this broken world, there are bad things that happen to good people. Yar is a man who was good, devoted unto God. He was a man that led the nation into worship and he restored the worship unto God. Yet he experienced a setback. Now, I just want to stop at that point and I want to say we all will experience setbacks. At one point in our life, we will all experience setbacks. In fact, I need to rephrase that. From time to time, we will experience setbacks. If you live long enough, you will experience attacks in the spirit. It's a part of life. And it's not if we experience attacks, but when we experience attacks, how are we going to respond? What are we going to do? The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, it says, fight the good fight of faith. In other words, we must fight the good fight of faith. It's a fight. This is a fight. S taking hold of your faith, standing on the word of God, believing that God can come through for you in spite of the opposition, in spite of the attacks, in spite of the problems that you're facing. It's a fight. It's a challenge. And I want to tell you, if you ever want to become an overcomer, 
There are things that you're going to have to overcome. The Bible says we are more than overcomers through Christ. But that does not mean that things won't come against us. It means that we're going to have to overcome something to have a testimony that we are an overcomer. In fact, Jesus made it very clear that if we want to follow him, that we must know what the price is. And the price is the cross. Luke chapter 9 verse 23 in the Amplified Translation. Jesus said these words. If anyone wishes to follow me as my disciple... He must deny himself, set aside selfish interests and take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come and following me, believing in me, conforming to my example in, li in living and if need be in suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. When Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you need a cross. What Jesus was actually saying is, this is not going to be easy. This is not for the faint of heart. Whoever said being a Christian is easy. Whoever said it's popular to be a Christian. In fact, if you are a real Christian, the mark of your faith will be a cross. You've denied yourself. And Jesus said it's a daily sacrifice. It's a daily sacrifice where you say it's not about me. It's all about Jesus. I think sometimes we forget as Christians that Jesus calls us to a cross before he calls us to a crown. I think today the theology in churches is we've left out the cross part and we, we give people the promises of a crown and you will be given a crown and you're going to be blessed and God is going to prosper you. But we leave out the cross part and when people come to the church, they buy into that message and they don't realize that Jesus himself, our founder of our faith, said that we need a cross and we need to deny ourselves even in suffering. But why would God allow suffering? Because it's through suffering that God would glorify himself. We see this in the story of Lazarus in John chapter 11. The Bible says that Lazarus was gravely ill and it seemed like he was going to die. And Martha and Mary sent a message to Jesus and said, the one that you love is sick. And Jesus says something interesting in John chapter 11 from verse 3 to verse 5. He says, this sickness will not end in death, but it will be to the glory of the Son of God. In other words, through the sickness, I will be glorified. And I want to tell you, through your suffering, through your pain, God can get glory. How will you ever know that God can come through for you if you don't face opposition, if you don't experience attacks? How will you ever have a testimony that God can heal if you never experience sickness? It's not God that puts the pain in your life. It's not God that authors the pain, but through it, God glorifies himself. And we need to get revelation for our situation. Remember, we are living in a broken world. We are living in a broken world today. And there are bad things that happen to good people, as I've said. Yah is Hezekiah, a good man. Yet he is suffering in the scripture. Yet he's lying on his deathbed. The Bible says that the prophet Isaiah came to visit him. This was his pastor. His pastor came to visit him now. You can imagine you busy lying on your deathbed. It just doesn't seem as if the situation is getting better. You call for your pastor and here comes your pastor. Your family and you have been trusting on God that things will get better. And here comes the pastor and he's got a message from God. And what's the message? Isaiah tells Hezekiah, get your house in order for you won't recover from the sickness, but you will die. What a nice message. What a nice pastor, well, a prophet, to bring such a message to a man that's in a desperate situation. You think you've got a bad pastor, or maybe you don't really like your pastor, or if you've had a bad experience with a pastor in the past. But yeah, in the Bible, we see Hezekiah's pastor, the prophet Isaiah. He wasn't very compassionate. He just came to deliver the word that God gave him, and then he left. But what was Hezekiah's response? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 38, we read the response of Hezekiah. 
And his response becomes the model for us. How we are to respond when we go through difficulties, when we are delivered a verdict, so to speak. When we receive bad news or a bad report, Hezekiah shows us what it means to fully trust in God in moments of desperation like this. And maybe you've received a verdict. Maybe you've received divorce papers. Maybe your business has been hit with a huge amount of debt and it seems as if you're going to maybe have to close down your business. Maybe you've come to the conclusion that your child will never come right or your husband or your wife will never be the companion that you want them to be. And now you're beginning to accept a verdict, so to speak. You're beginning to accept a verdict over your life. Maybe you've received a doctor's report or the doctor has diagnosed you with something. And you know that it is a sickness or a disease. And this is going to impact your life. I've come tonight to tell you that what people have said, and even the experts... It is all good and well what they say according to their knowledge and their expertise. But you've got a God in heaven that knows about you. You've got a God in heaven that sees you. And I want to tell you tonight, God has got the final say. And what was the response of Hezekiah? And what should your response and my response be? The Bible says, Isaiah chapter 38, verse 2 to 3, Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. His response was prayer. And what did he pray? Remember, Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion. And I've done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. He cried out to God. You see, Hezekiah at that moment had every reason just to lie in his bed, roll over and die. Because even the prophet said that he was going to die. The verdict was he was going to die. But Hezekiah did not accept the verdict. No, Hezekiah turned on his side, faced the wall where his bed was, and he began praying. He began praying. You see, there needs to be a certain amount of aggression in your spirit. When the devil comes and he hits you with bad news, you need to get aggressive in the spirit. You might not be strong physically and you might not be strong emotionally and maybe you drained and maybe it feels like you've got no more fight in you. But I've come to tell you tonight, it's time to believe that God's best is ahead of you, that your best days aren't behind you. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 11 verse 12, the kingdom suffers violence and the violent take it by force. In other words, those that trust in God are aggressive in their faith. They take by force. What belongs to them? The devil wants to lie to you and say it's over. The devil wants to lie to you and say you, you're never going to recover. You're never going to be healed. Just accept the verdict. But I've come tonight to challenge the verdict in the name of the Lord. And to, and to tell you, do not believe the lies of the enemy. Trust in God. God wants to reverse the verdict. The Bible says these words. As the prophet Isaiah was leaving the palace, the word of God came to Isaiah. He gets a download, so to speak, from heaven. And God says these words. Go and tell Hezekiah. This is what the Lord God of your father David says. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your tears and I will add 15 years to your life. Isaiah 38 verse 5. I have heard your prayer. I have seen your faith. In the midst of disappointment, in the midst of bad news, I have seen you put your trust in me. There's nothing that moves God like faith. And what we need more than ever is faith in God. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. When bad times come, when you experience setbacks and attacks, What is your response? And I want to ask you, how are you going to respond when setbacks do come? The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 30, David was out in the battlefield. 
He came back from the battlefield and he went to his hometown called Ziklag. When he came there, there, him and his men of war, they found the whole of Ziklag burnt down and the women and children were missing. The tribe of the Amalekites had come through and burnt down everything in Ziklag and stolen the women and children. The Bible says the situation was so grave that these great men of war started weeping and crying until they had no more strength. Have you wept until you've had no more strength? Have you wept until you emotionally drained? But the Bible says David did something and it's an encouragement to me. And I pray that it will be an encouragement to you. The Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 30 verse 6 that David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. In the midst of pain, in the midst of disappointment, in the midst of heartbreak, in the midst of uncertainty, David turns to God. I want to challenge you tonight, my brother, my sister, turn to God. Maybe you've received bad news. You've received the verdict. And man says it's impossible for you to overcome. But I've come to tell you what's impossible with man is possible with God. Matthew chapter 19 verse 26. David strengthened himself in the Lord. And the Lord spoke to him. And the Lord told him to pursue the Amalekites and he will recover all. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Don't accept the lies of the enemy. The enemy wants to lie to you. The enemy wants you to accept the verdict. Because once you've accepted the verdict, well, then it belongs to you. No matter what comes against you, not everything that comes against you. Let me say this. Not everything that comes against you belongs to you. Until you accept it and you make it your own, then it is yours. I don't accept bad news. I don't accept the bad report. I don't accept sickness. I don't accept negativity. I don't accept a curse. I choose to believe in God's word. I choose to put my trust in God. I choose to pray in the midst of heartache and brokenness. The Bible says in Joshua chapter 6 that the city of Jericho was, was um, bound up. And it was shut up and nobody could go in and nobody could come out. In other words, it was concluded that it was impossible to take Jericho. It was impossible to possess the city of Jericho in the land of Canaan. But Joshua did not listen to what people were saying. He listened to God. Because God spoke to him in a divine way and told him to go and possess the promised land, to take the cities. And he had an encounter with God in Joshua chapter 5. And that prepared him to go and possess what man said was impossible to possess. We need to get aggressive in our faith. We need to get our fight back. We need to believe God for more. We need to raise our faith to a higher level. You know, God can change the verdict. God changed the verdict of Hezekiah. Maybe you say tonight, but the Bible says God does not change. Yes, I know. The Bible says God does not change. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. He does not change. His character, the very essence of his being does not change. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. But his judgments and his verdicts do. Jeremiah chapter 26 verse 3. God says, I will change my verdict, my judgment regarding Judah if they repent and they turn back to me. In other words, God says, if my people would just call on me, if my people would just repent, then I will change the verdict. That's what 2 Chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 says. If my people who are called by my name would humble themselves, seek my face and pray, I will hear from heaven and I will heal and restore their land. God can change the verdict in this nation. I know these people that are saying that South Africa will never again be prosperous. South Africa is going to become a bad country. It's just going down the tubes. But I've come to tell you tonight, we as people of God can change that verdict. I believe that God can do something significant in this nation. And it starts with us. It doesn't start with the president and parliament. It starts with us as believers because we've got an open connection to heaven. We can move the heart of God to move yeah, in this nation. We see it in the story of Abraham in Genesis chapter 18 where God visited Abraham. And God spoke to Abraham and he told Abraham that he's going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah for the sin that they've committed. 
And Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah because his nephew Lot stayed in Sodom. And he asked God to spare the city of Sodom if there were only 50 good people. But Abraham himself knew there weren't enough good people in Sodom. And he brought down that amount to 10 people. He kept praying and asking. It's actually a picture of prayer and intercession. And he kept asking the Lord, please do not destroy Sodom. As a result of what Abraham asked, God spared Lot. I want to ask you, are your prayers not the breakthrough that somebody else needs? The devil wants to keep you from praying because if he keeps you from praying, not only you, but other people can't experience the breakthrough that they need. Lot was able to be spared judgment because Abraham interceded for him. We need to get back to the basics. We need to put our trust in God. There is power in prayer. Hezekiah prayed and God heard his prayer. There's a story of how there were four friends that did not accept the verdict of a friend that became lame in Luke chapter 5. The Bible says that there was crowds coming to Jesus and he was preaching in a certain house. And because the crowds were all around this house, there were four friends that came with a lame man. And they realized that they weren't able to get through the door because the crowds surrounded this house. So they took their lame friend onto the top of a roof. We in that house where Jesus was preaching, they opened up the roof. They took away the roof tiles and they lowered their friend in the presence of Jesus. And when they did that, they took him to Jesus because they believed that Jesus could change the verdict. They believed that Jesus could heal this man. And the Bible says something fascinating in Luke chapter 5 verse 20. When Jesus saw their faith. When Jesus saw their faith, the faith of the friends that brought that lame man to him, Jesus said to the lame man, my friend, your sins are forgiven. In other words, he was healed as a result of his friends that weren't willing to accept that that is our friend's lot in life. I think we've come to a place where we've accepted the verdict too easily. We've accepted circumstances. We've become almost numb to the circumstances of life. But I've come tonight to challenge you. And actually, I'm speaking to myself not to accept the verdict, to believe God for more, that God can reverse the verdict and that God can bless you. God blessed Hezekiah. He gave him another 15 years of life. What more can God do with you? What more can God do through you? Maybe you trust in him for healing. God can give it to you right now. He's already done it at the cross. Maybe you're trusting God for breakthrough in debt. I want to tell you, God can cancel your debt in a moment. Maybe you're trusting God for healing and restoration in your marriage. God can do it right now. There is nothing that is impossible to God. God can bring back your rebellious child. God can restore your relationship with a loved one. God can restore the years that the locust and the canker worm has eaten. All he needs you to do is to have faith in him. Mark chapter 11 verse 22. Have faith in God. And I want to leave you with that word today. And I pray that this word encourages you and that this word blesses you. Do not accept the verdict. Believe that the best is yet to come. That breakthrough is going to come. Let us pray. Father God of our Lord Jesus Christ, we come to you tonight as brothers and sisters in Christ. And we want to thank you for this word, the story of Hezekiah. I want to thank you, Lord, Father God, that we don't have to experience or let, Lord, let me say this, not accept the verdict of the world, but that we can go to your word and experience revelation and receive revelation and accept your promises in spite of the verdict, in spite of the circumstances. Lord, be gracious unto us, Lord, Father God, where we have doubted and where we have grown weak in our faith. Lord, pick us up today. Strengthen my brothers and sisters that are watching right now. Encourage them in their faith. And I pray, Lord, for your hand to be upon them. I pray, Lord, that you give them revelation for their situation. And I thank you, Lord, that you are a good God, that you see us, that you know us, that you will never leave us nor forsake us. 
I thank you, Lord, right now that you are changing the verdict of so many people. That people's faith is being elevated right now as they listen to this word and as they are praying with me. I thank you, Lord, that you are reversing the verdict. I thank you for marriages that are being restored. I thank you for healing that is coming to loved ones, not just loved ones, but those that are listening to their bodies. I thank you, Lord, that debt is being canceled. I thank you, Lord, that what seems impossible right now, you will make possible for you are God. Lord, we give you all the glory and honor for your faithfulness, for your goodness. And we, Lord, acknowledge that it's you alone that is good, that you alone are God. We give you all the glory and honor. We pray this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to invite you to pray the sinner's prayer with me. Actually, it's a prayer of salvation. If you have drifted away from God and you know you are not in the right place in your relationship with God, this is your moment to make right with God. God wants to do a work in your life. But I want to ask you, have you backslidden? Have you grown lukewarm in your faith? Or maybe you've just never given your heart to Jesus. Right now, this is your moment. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your lips and you believe in your heart, then you will be saved. All you have to do is believe that Jesus died for you on the cross. My friend, it's that easy. And all you have to do is pray and say, Lord, come into my heart. I want to lead you in that prayer. Would you pray with me? Just say these words. Say, dear Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight. I give you my heart. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean in your blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I confess, Jesus, that you died on the cross and that you rose from the grave. I believe in you, Jesus. I give you my life. Amen. If you pray that prayer, I believe you've received the gift of salvation. It doesn't stop now. Now an exciting journey become, uh, begins where you walk with God, where you talk with God, where you have a relationship with the living God. My friend, there's no greater joy or peace on this side of eternity than having a relationship with God. Spend time in prayer. Talk to God every single morning, every single night. Go to church. Get into a good spiritual family, get into a church that preaches faith and that preaches you on fire for God, where your faith is elevated and support that pastor. And as you put God first, God's going to do the miraculous in your life in spite of the circumstances. I want to thank you for taking the time to watch. Thank you to all of you that have taken the time to watch. I appreciate it from the bottom of my heart. If you're going to go offline now, God bless you. Have a wonderful evening. And for all of you that are online, please drop a comment quickly down below. I would love to greet you. This is, after all, a live Facebook service. It's interactive. That's the beauty of these Facebook platforms where we can just interact with one another. So please take the time to drop a comment. I want to greet you. God bless you if you're going off. Well, let me quickly read the comments. Everybody that's online. Jody Kriya says, hello, family. Jody, welcome. It's good to have you online, my brother. I trust that you are well. I trust that you are blessed and I trust that everything is going well there at the shutdown. Elian Kriya says, good evening all. It's good to have you online, Elian. I trust that you are doing well. Rene Stofberg says, goeie aand amal. Rene, welcome. It's good to have you online. Sandra Radley, good evening to you. Marty Miller, it's good to have you online and it's just a pleasure for the word. I see your message came through now. Thank you so much for the good message. And please phone me. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a call in a moment. But Marty, I trust that you are doing well. You must have a blessed evening and we will speak in a moment. Tasha DeToy says, good evening. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Marty Swartz, thank you very much for taking the time to watch. Mandy Mayer, it's good to have you online. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Trudy de Beer, good evening to you. God bless you. Marty Schwartz says she's watching all the way from Richards Bay. Thank you very much, Marty. It's good to have you with us. 
Thank you so much. We are a spiritual family here online and we love to take the time to pray for one another. And Sandra Radley says she's watching from Ranfontein. Amen. John Dean, my brother, it's good to have you online. God bless you, my brother. Peter Fori, good evening. I trust that you are well, Peter. It's always good to see you online, Peter. Henry Bridger, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Diane Burning, it's good to have you online. God bless you. I trust that you are doing well. Melissa Jane Zaid, it's good to have you online. God bless you. John Dean, thank you for your nice message. I really appreciate it. Peter Fori says, God has the final say. Amen. I like what the great British evangelist Smith Wigglesworth said. If God said it, that settles it and I accept it. So we need to accept God's word. We can't go to the doctor Hear what the doctor says and then decide what we're going to believe. We've got to go to the doctor in spite of what the doctor says, already have our belief in God's word. Now, I'm not, I'm not against doctors. In fact, I believe God has blessed us with doctors and wisdom and with the knowledge so that we can help people with medical conditions. And there are doctors that are wonderful doctors, that are faithful doctors, that are led by the Holy Spirit. So doctors aren't bad. But we cannot limit our faith by the verdict of someone, even though they are an expert. Remember, God is the creator, the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the creator of heaven and earth. He's Alpha and Omega. He created your body. He knows exactly what's going on in your body. And we need to put our trust in God. But we need to use wisdom and discernment in this regard. So I'm not of the belief that we just write off pastors and what, uh, sorry, we write off doctors and whatever they say, well, we're not going to believe what doctors say. No, we need to take all of that and we need to filter it through our faith and allow our faith to have the final say. Amen. Lisa Kriya, it's good to have you online. God bless you. The best is yet to come. Amen. I believe it with you, Lisa. Amen. Amen. It's good to have everyone online. Belay, it's good to have you online. God bless you. It's good to have everybody online. Beverly, it's good to have you online. It's good to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to watch. Joey Willifield, it's good to have you online. God bless you. Renee Stoffbach, we're going to trust God for healing for your mother. And I believe God is going to do a work in your mother's life. Amen. Jeanette Foshia, thank you so much for taking the time to watch. God bless you. Amen. Amen. Lenta Fori, it's good to have you online. Madela Madeline Nordea, thank you very much for taking the time to watch. Hi to you too, Madeline. Well, thank you to everybody that's taken the time to watch. Thank you to you that's taken the time to share this live broadcast. Have a blessed evening. I will be here uh, on Saturday night, but it's going to be a bit earlier. I'm going to start at half past six. So half past six, I will start on Saturday night. So please remember, it's going to be an hour and a half earlier on Saturday. I'll be sharing the word of God with you. So have a blessed evening. May you experience God's goodness in all that you do. And I pray for each one of you. I pray that God blesses you. And thank you, thank you, thank you for taking the time to watch once again. This is Pastor Dominic. I'm signing out.